This is a conversation with Tim Chung, who is a program manager in the Tactical Defense Office at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, also known as DARPA. We speak about the DARPA Subterranean Challenge, or Sub-T, which is a robotics challenge that aims to develop innovative technologies to augment operations underground. I was excited about this interview as I have heard a lot about the Sub-T Challenge around the edges here at Open Robotics, but it wasn't one of the projects that I'm working on, so I was happy for this opportunity to learn more. From the interview, it seems like the Sub-T Challenge was a great success and that the challenge stimulated a lot of great work. You'll hear more from Tim during this interview. I also found it fascinating to talk about how DARPA picks their robotics challenges, and very importantly, how they scope the difficulty of these challenges. This is the Sense Think Act podcast. I'm Audro Nash. Thank you to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. And now, here is my conversation with Tim Chung. Hi, Tim. Would you introduce yourself? Sure. Hi, Audro. My name is Tim Chung. I'm a program manager at the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA. And uh, I'm the program manager for a couple of programs that involve robotics and autonomy. Mm -hmm. And so this interview is mostly going to be about the subterranean challenge. Would you tell me a bit about that? Sure. The DARPA subterranean challenge is all about inspiring folks from all around the world to discover revolutionary technologies for robotics so that they can help in diverse underground settings for time critical missions. Mm -hmm. And so... This competition has already occurred, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What did right. what did it look like? Like, what kind of challenges were involved? Yeah. So I like to describe the DARPA sub T challenge, as we call it, mm -hmm. as kind of like this underground scavenger hunt slash triathlon for robots. <laughs> so the general idea here that we've heard time and time again from many of the folks, like those first responders that need to go into really challenging environments is, you know, how come this one piece of component technology works in the, in the one tunnel or the, or the one parking garage that I tested it in, but not in all the others that I have to take this equipment into. And so the sub T challenge was about how do we get robotic technologies to work across many different types of underground settings. And that includes human made tunnels like mines for mine search and rescue uh, urban underground, that's everything from subway tunnels to infrastructure like storm drains to parking garages, and even naturally occurring cave networks. So for the cave rescue type settings, uh, how would you get robots to be the best triathlete, not just the best runner or cyclist, but you really want that well-rounded, robust, um, capable set of teams of robots to go do this. And the problem that we posed in the sub challenge was this underground scavenger hunt. DARPA goes into these environments, places, objects of interest, and it's up to these teams of robots to go out and find them and report them back to their human teammates. What would be an object of interest? Like, What's, a, what's an example? Yeah, so we really intentionally set up a whole array of artifacts, as we like to call them. So you might think, for example, we put a, a survivor artifact. This is a mannequin. So it looks like a survivor. It uh, um, has that visual appearance, but it also was a thermal mannequin. So it has a thermal signature that's human-like. Wow. And it even had a voice box. So you could you know, have voice recordings or sound recordings in there. And so those robots going in to look for the survivor artifacts, of course, most typically carry cameras. Mm -hmm. That kind of makes sense. But if you wanted to do a little bit better or use other cues, Maybe you're going to have a thermal camera on board or a set of microphones. And that's just one example of the 10 types of artifacts that we placed in these courses. Uh, we had a cell phone in there that mm. on the camera, probably really hard to find, but with its Wi-Fi in hotspot mode oh, on cool. and Bluetooth in discoverable mode, now you can start listening for RF signatures for signs of life. We even had something we call the gas artifact. And this gas artifact clearly has no visual signature, but instead, uh, in, in this case, we we're, of course, being safe. So we used CO2, carbon dioxide. Mm -hmm. um, but you can imagine that, uh, that these robots equipped with CO2 sensors, gas sensors could be used to figure out where there's good air versus bad air or noxious chemicals that might endanger those responders going into these unknown environments. And so this 
a quite wide array of types of artifacts meant that you can't just send in one robot with one type of sensor, mm -hmm. but in fact, likely benefit from teams of robots carrying an array of sensors to kind of cross queue and help each other out, much like we do as humans. Or you could, I mean, so I could imagine one robot that has like every sensor possible, but maybe this isn't the best strategy. So then you said teams of robots. What does a team of robots look, look like? Yeah, well, one of the things that we kind of uh, telegraphed early on in this whole competition, and this is the culmination of multiple years of teams coming together to build and, and ultimately break some of their robots. Um, but we said attrition is not only possible, but likely in these types of really challenging <laughs> environments, yeah. terrain and other things. So for any team that came with that one glorious robot loaded out with all of its sensors, man, that's really putting all your eggs in one basket. Uh -huh. And so, um, you know, thinking through uh, what that means for your strategy, for your, your competition gameplay, if you will, um, really led many of our teams to think about diversifying their robot portfolio. Mm -hmm. And that not only means the types of sensors that go on different types of robots, but how they even use them in terms of like the positions on the team or the roles on the team. Mm -hmm. So all of that coming together, you had all sorts of robot types that could get into crawl into different spaces, maybe fly into high verticals or other open areas. Some had legs that could walk upstairs or downstairs or traverse mm -hmm. slightly more rugged terrain, tracks, wheels, you name it. Uh, that's what the challenge was all about is to go and highlight that the problem is this, bring your best and brightest solutions to figure out what solves these problems. Uh -huh. And I'd like to just think about the, or kind of make explicit the like difficult robotics challenges that are involved in this competition. So like whether it, it would like, can you speak a bit about it? Like I imagine like mud and reflective surfaces and like all sorts of other things, but what were some of the challenges that were especially difficult for robots in this situation? Yeah, you, you, you name some of them for sure. I think uh, having been and crawled through a number of tunnels and urban settings and caves myself, you know, I can testify, I can testify that, that, that these are the types of challenge elements that made it hard for humans, let alone robots, to navigate. So some of those you already mentioned, the types of surfaces, mud, moisture, puddles, water, mm -hmm. uh, you never, you know, we might be able to see or tell if the puddle depth is just an inch and I'm going to be able to step on right through, but the reflectivity of that and the difficulty that robots might have, mm -hmm. that makes it a really daunting kind of, you know, survival question of whether or not to step foot or roll into a potential puddle or a, you know, potential hole. Yeah. Um, lighting, lighting is a major issue. Mm -hmm. So you, oftentimes you are only reliant on the lighting you bring yourself. Um, a lot of times there's dust or fog or certainly in emergency settings, you can imagine things like smoke, including many of your sensors. So thinking through what kind of paradigms you would use to be able to navigate when you really can't see, again, in the context of cameras. Mm -hmm. um, so DARPA uh, used smoke machines <laughs> to go and plug some sections of these uh, environments so that we would intentionally stress test some of that. Mm -hmm. And then you start to learn, you know, things like um, you know, what types of sensors are transparent to certain types of dust or, mm -hmm. Hey, if I fly my multi rotors, my flying vehicles, they're going to kick up dust as they're flying oh, through yeah. as was the case in these mines. And that can hose your sensors as well. So self-inflicted sensing problems as well. So mm -hmm. um, verticality, I'll, I'll throw that one out. Uh, so the three-dimensional nature is a really big player in these underground settings because you're not just going out, but you're also going down or up. Um, and, and so elevator shafts to stairwells of varying types to scrambling up older piles to wow. um, other opportunities to look in these wide open caverns that you might find. Mm -hmm. um, so a real, real, you know, like a, a real diverse set of those kind of challenge elements and um, never knowing what's around that next corner is is perhaps the most daunting challenge for most of these robots. Yeah, for sure. How did you? Um, how were teams structured? So I know there was the hardware and the software, com or the the um, systems and simulation components of this. Mm -hmm. 
Um, but for the hardware one, um, how did you say a team can have some certain number of, how, how did you organize what robots a team could have and was there standardization? Yeah. Sure. Well, so as you mentioned, there's the systems competition and the virtual competition, mm -hmm. and there were our, our sister competitions where uh, one could uh, build and, and design and break robots, and the other you would do all of that in the cloud, in a simulator. Mm -hmm. um, and so in the context of the parameters which we define the challenge, it was, quite frankly, quite loosely defined intentionally. In some cases, it's the... Uh, you know, without constraining the design or solution space, sometimes you, that's where you find those really creative or solutions, innovative solutions, right? And so and this is specifically um, for the hardware, uh, the systems yeah, version this, of the competition. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that's right. And so we would uh, specify that the type of environment is a coal mine, mm -hmm. and uh, highlight that most you know robots. If you want to reach all parts of the course, you need to be able to fit through a one by one meter area. So something like a manhole cover. Mm -hmm. um, if you elected to bring much larger robots, then yeah, you still might be able to access parts of the course, but you're probably going to be leaving some points on the table mm -hmm. if you can't access some other segments of the course. Mm -hmm. And then beyond that, quite frankly, DARPA, you know, left it to the competitors' imaginations to identify not only what they might face, but what robot types or technologies would be uh, advantageous for them to bring to to conquer that kind of an environment. Mm. Um, so there was no limit on the number of robots. Mm. There was very little limit on the you know style of robots. Mm -hmm. uh, there were some safety considerations on maybe exotic fuel types or what have you. But other than that, uh, <laughs> yeah. teams were able to use existing available platforms and then really just keep on sensors or payloads, radios, or what have you on top. Or we did have teams that designed robots from scratch, mm -hmm. really thinking through the nuances of these underground environments in their build design. Wow. So, um, yeah, what, you know, clean sheet uh, approach to trying to solve a really hard technical problem uh, as a kind of a mechanism here for, uh, identifying interesting solutions that, you know, frankly, we might not have seen or, or thought about uh, mm -hmm. had we too narrowly defined the problem. Gotcha. Was there like a, a budget constraint for the teams or was there, was it like open budget? Um, you can kind of buy, buy and bring whatever you will for the um, systems competition. Yeah, it, it, it really was kind of open. Mm -hmm. Teams could, and in fact, many did seek out external sponsorships or uh, donated hardware. Uh, one of our teams found some, uh, uh, re repurposed some robots that he found on Craigslist. Wow, that's and crazy. And was able to turn those into a ground robotic suite. Right? Oh. Um, and so being really creative with both the, t the, the resources that you have and the solutions you want to bring to bear, mm -hmm. you know, that's where a lot of that creativity came. Gotcha. So what was the, what did some of the teams look like? Like, how would you describe some of the robots? Maybe that show kind of the diversity of um, teams of robots that were entered. Yeah. Well, what was really exciting from my perspective about the Subti Challenge is we had constructed it in kind of a uh, uh, iterative development manner. And so we started off, for example, in a coal mine and we called it our tunnel circuit so of course those human-made tunnels thinking about the mine rescue type scenarios consulting with mine rescue uh, responders and so forth we went to a coal mine and then approximately six months after that we went to an unfinished nuclear power plant and that was our urban circuit mm -hmm. and then working uh, and exploring po the possibility of kind of transforming a cave into a test course uh, but of course, we did have to cancel that due to COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but then uh, the final event allowed us to bring together all three of those types of environments together. And we'll, I'm sure we'll have a chance to talk about that here in a bit. But we fabricated this course that allowed teams to test their robots against all three of these environment types, all in this magnificent course that that, uh, that DARPA fabricated. Mm -hmm. um, and so... The, the reason I bring that up is because you saw there was no one 
form factor for a team, there was this continuous growth or evolution, if you will, cool. of both the individual technologies, but also the team compositions. Mm -hmm. And so we saw a lot of robots that were uh, wheeled, and we tried to see some flying robots in the tunnel circuit in the coal mines. And I can say that the wheeled robots did well and the flying robots did not. Mm -hmm. And that was a great learning point. Whereas we pivot to the urban circuit, now these are expansive, think everything from warehouses to uh, uh, elevator shafts to other things that these drones really helped allow robots, uh, kind of the teams to go and explore places that just a ground robotic fleet would never have been able to do. And that also saw uh, the showcasing of legged robots, these quadruped robots, cool. uh, so that they could go up and down stairs with a fair bit more ease than some of their wheeled counterparts. Um, and so you, you kind of see this progression of both tailoring the fleet, right? Who's going to be in your starting lineup uh, might be a little bit shaped by the type of environment you're going to send these fleets of robots into. But by and large, uh, that continued learning process culminated in the final event where I'd say you saw a pretty healthy mix of air, ground, wheeled and legged. Uh, we even had marsupial robots, so ground robots carrying aerial robots on their on their back, piggybacking them in so cool. to other parts of the course. Um, and, and really that, that diversity... The, the the fact that there's not one kind of common makeup of a team, um, I think, is is a hallmark of kind of the, the you know the, the what we we're going for in in a challenge of being able to tease out all these various ways to uh, attack this problem. Mm -hmm. Now, how do you? Um, I guess so. You have these teams. These teams all have the hardware. Um, mm -hmm. They go, and the competition is about finding. The markers, or um, what were you calling them? The points of interest? Yeah, those artifacts. The artifacts. Those artifacts. And yeah. also it was about, what, total distance covered or something like this? this these were the two significant um, indicators of performance? Or yeah, so how did it work? We, we, yeah, we, you know, we, we kept it as simple as you have a fixed amount of time. You have an hour. Mm-hmm. And you have to go and find these artifacts. And what we mean by that is you have to be able to return the location and the type of the artifact that you found. Mm -hmm. You know, and you, you have to do that location positioning to within five meters. So, so you, the idea here um, is, yeah, so you go into these places, you have no GPS. I should have, you know, maybe stated that up front. Yeah. Um, and so you're moving through these environments and, you know, it's pretty easy to get twisted and turned around and, and, and get lost. And so uh, being able to report out where you found that survivor artifact, for example, mm -hmm. to within five meters of global position mm -hmm. uh, so that if you had to send in humans they would know to right go to that location, it. it'd be pinpointed within nominally within arm's reach. That's the kind of notional metric for firefighters. Oh. You want to get them within arm span reach because it's going to be smoke filled yep. and they need to be able to reach out and wow. touch the thing that they got sent in to, to go find. So uh, within five meters, you have to go find that out. And it's not sufficient to have found it, but you have to get to get that Identified. information back out. Right. Uh, you have to get it correct, of course, what type it is, but then you have to report it out. And if you successfully report out the position to within that five meters, and the correct type, then you get a point. Mm -hmm. And so the teams that find the most artifacts in that hour are the ones that take home, you know, uh, the, the, get to do the victory lap. Get the prize. And it was, the prize. The, the prize was for, the, the, what was the prize for the competition? Yeah. So we had cash prizes. This is one of the hallmarks of these DARPA grand challenges. And so for that systems competition, building the robots and such, the top place took home two million dollars wow. to, to to their credit that's awesome and uh, very good um like publicity and everything too which is wonderful yeah yep uh, that's right it's, it's the glory of winning the challenge for sure the darker challenge. so the mm -hmm. robots uh going back to finding the artifacts they mm -hmm. would you're not providing the robots a map of the mines or of the environment beforehand they're building it while they're going through it is that correct yeah, that's absolutely correct. In fact, that's one of the hallmarks of how we constructed the Sub-T Challenge. 
neither robot nor human knew the uh, on these competitor teams has set foot inside this course and know anything really about it. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it really is about exploring the an unknown environment and then exploiting it to go and find those artifacts quickly gotcha. and returning that information. Gotcha. So the robots are building a map while they're going in it. And this is yep. why you can get twisted up. So if the robot's building in an accurate map, say it's like a crew accumulating error as it's building the map. Yeah. Absolutely. Then yep. the map might be inaccurate, inaccurate, and then you could um, you could say I found something and I found it here, but um, because it found it and the map is distorted, the location is wrong, and thus yep. they Absolutely. would get no points uh, because yep. of the distorted map. Gotcha. That's right. Now, one thing that I imagine because it's or that I've seen uh, discussed in watching some of the videos about sub T, um, one of the major challenges was networking. Can you talk a bit about this? Yeah, sure. I think this is probably one of the um, understated types of problems when you go into these underground environments that no amount of testing in a lab or in even the basement of a university <laughs> building will really get you the, the, the feel of RF, the radio frequency of underground environments, because it's just so tightly coupled to everything from the thickness of the concrete, whether there are steel girders or you know rebar, mm -hmm. if there's you know metallic you know uh, uh, metals in the in the soil, you know all of those. If it rained that morning, you know mm -hmm. it, 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 that plays a role. And so, because of those dependencies, so so hard to really think about uh, communications uh, in in a robust way. Now, that was one of the four technology areas that the sub challenge was deeply interested in. And so we did see teams really get, um, in some cases, both uh, surprised and uh, confounded mm -hmm. by how their comm solutions were working underground. So we saw a lot of different approaches. We had some teams come up with tethered robots that they would deploy from the outside uh, and, and tether as long as they could um, to maintain connectivity mm -hmm. and it's a long use cable, that robot. As I well. imagine. Yeah, long it's a long cable. cable. <laughs> as they're like twisted, it would get snagged, it yeah. would be a, uh, a tangle hazard. <laughs> um, and so there are many, many good reasons why not to use a tether, but some uh, were able to make good use of that. There were others that used breadcrumbs. So now I'm carrying breadcrumb relay nodes on, on the robot. And as they traverse either a fixed amount of distance, mm -hmm. kind of like Hansel and Gretel, they or would corner uh, or some drop. Yep. That's right. So they would drop, uh, yeah, like these, Hansel and Gretel. You're right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, breadcrumb comms nodes and that would allow them to relay their communications from robot to robot or robot to base station. Mm -hmm. And then you had other models of comms, which was, you know, I'm going to live without communications. Oh. I'm going to go, I'm going to go off the grid for a little while, do my searching, scouting, back. mapping, finding, and then after either a set amount of time or maybe I have really good data that I don't want to lose, mm -hmm. I'm going to come back into comms and then try to dump it, you know, to to my teammate or mm -hmm. uh, or or to the base station. So there are all sorts of comms technologies, but also comms strategies that emerged as a way to deal with the difficulties of RF, of communicating underground. Mm -hmm. Is there, um, so I guess there's a lot of structural things that make it really hard to do radio frequencies in these like tunnels and things like this. Like you turn a corner and then the signal um, kind of just right. doesn't bounce down the, the hall, or down back through the corner and so you can't get it out. And so that's why there were all these difficult, this was, this was such a difficulty. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And, and and that's a good rule of thumb. You know, if you turn the corner, <laughs> your signal goes down dramatically. Yep. Um, and uh, you know, if, if you've ever had those kind of problems getting your cell service uh, working in a subway station or um, you know something like that, you you know that uh, you know RF just doesn't propagate as well underground and through the earth. And so um, that's something that the teams really had to wrestle with. Yeah. I'm curious about, um, so the motivation for this competition, um, part of it, it's first responders and things like this. Um, can you talk a bit more about this? Mm -hmm. 
Sure. Well, I'd say I was highly motivated that um, many of the robotics technologies that we have, as well as some of the component technologies, whether sensors or radios. You still there? Or, uh, yep, still here. Ah, you're saying so many of the robotics technologies seem to freeze. Yeah, no worries. So many of the robotics technologies that we had, you know, four years ago, um, you know, even the component technologies of radios or component sensors, they were, you know, frankly limited in how robust they were, how resilient they were to that vast, very diverse set of underground settings. Mm -hmm. And so that's kind of number, from a technology point of view, we viewed this DARPA subterranean challenge as a way to uh, spotlight and accelerate technology development, not just of these individual small component technologies, but in fact, how we think about integrating all of them into resilient systems of technologies. And I think mm -hmm. that's kind of the technology motivation. But when we come back to it operationally, you know, if there is this period of time where uh, an emergency response scenario is occurring mm -hmm. and the incident commander is marshalling our forces and trying to figure out uh, what resources he has available, wouldn't it be great in that kind of roughly one to let's say four hour time period, you know, that, that, that golden hour, if you will, mm -hmm. um, before she knows enough to send in humans, mm -hmm. you know, at, at, the, at great risk, wouldn't it be great to send in robots? If we could do that and pinpoint where the survivors are located or trapped or otherwise, or even if it's what kind of equipment these first responders should be carrying in with them, mm. that was kind of the key takeaway. If you can tell me that I should be bringing in shoring equipment because the ceiling might collapse and that will prolong uh, and reduce risk to the responders that have oh. to operate in that environment, it'd be great that the firefighter didn't have to go in there first to figure sure. that out all the way back out and then carry in all of that equipment. Same with rebreathing equipment um, and things of that nature. So just being able to, we like to call it actionable situational awareness. Yeah. It's just not just, not just the map, which is really helpful. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, a, a lot of folks just kind of would be grateful just to even have <laughs> a map. Yeah. But DARPA likes to go well beyond uh, what is needed today and anticipate what would be, really beneficial in the future. Mm -hmm. And this notion of actionable situational awareness is this idea of being able to provide the incident commander who's about to send in her teams of humans the best possible set of information like hazards, where key objects of interest are, like those survivors, where, um, you know, where blind corners might be, where she might lose comms. Mm -hmm. All of those types of points are very relevant. And that's the kind of information we really wanted to be able to develop the technologies to be able to provide her in the long run so that really served as the motivating operational setting yeah um, and i think uh you know, it's been exciting to see how this technology has matured to try to meet that mark for sure to me it seems like the two hardest parts of this competition for robotics teams would be um first the networking and then also just the mobility getting around mm -hmm. in these environments. Cause I think um, like I, you can find different sensor pack and maybe I'm mistaken in this, uh, but I imagine you can find different sensors that are good in different environments, um, but they may have big power. They may be bulky. They may have big power requirements, whatever it might be. Um, but it seems like given the constraint of these tunnels or these environments where comms aren't really good, it's like, the big benefits of this challenge would be testing actual robot hardware in these environments to see how well it can do um, and maybe like what approaches might be a bit more robust. And then the second part would be, okay, now that we have these robots moving around, how do we get them communicating their information out um, or connecting? So, I mean, like you could have kind of dumb robots that aren't doing much of the compute other than like their localization and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they're sending information all the way back outside um, for processing and kind of keeping a global state of the situation or whatever it would be. Yeah. But it, it seems like yeah, these are right. kind of the two areas that are pushed most by this competition. Yeah. To me. So, so you, you, you nailed them. And so in fact, we had four tech areas that we predominantly focused on. Mm -hmm. uh, the first, uh, the first ones you already mentioned, it's the networking, 
mobility is the second one. You know, you got to be able to get to these places, of mm -hmm. course. But the other two areas that um, I'd also highlight are the autonomy, the decision making of these robots mm. in the face of significant uncertainty. Mm. And then the fourth and final was the perception piece. So how do you tie together not just, like you said, the sensors, but what you do with that information? Mm. Uh, how do you fuse different sensing views, right? Those myriad sensors that you might be carrying, how do they provide you with a common picture of what is actually happening in this environment? And so all four, autonomy, mobility, networking, and perception, they kind of really need to all come together. For sure. And we found the most successful teams were the ones that really thought about it holistically, and they didn't, again, rely solely on an autonomy solution to solve all of their networking problems or yeah. didn't you know invest all of their dollars uh, in the best radios and forego uh thinking about sensors and perception so um yeah it's like four really independent dimensions really and you have yeah, to invest yeah. in all it, to be successful in this competition i, I, I think that's a true yeah that's a true statement mm -hmm. I think I need to change the name of this podcast to have something about networking <laughs> because sensing, yeah. thinking, <laughs> acting are kind of they are analogous to three of those. But then yeah. networking, systems, robots, kind of funny. Yeah, and and that's um, kind of another insight coming from this competition has been uh, the the role of teams, mm -hmm. not just. Uh, you know, we might think of robots and humans as teammates, mm -hmm. and, and then you have robots and robots as teammates. And so just like you said, the name of this <laughs> yeah. podcast, but there's this additional element where in addition to what autonomy, perception, and mobility I might have as an individual player, how do I leverage the team so that I can cover all the bases appropriately so that maybe I don't need, you know, it's, it's like the relay races. I, I, I don't need to be the best cyclist if I know uh, I'm a good runner and my teammates are the good cyclists. Oh. They can help augment what I might be deficient in. Um, and, and so that, that kind of level of flexibility, kind of the, the, the design choices, the, the, that just explodes the design space really. Mm -hmm. um, and um, you know, I think that's really one of the fascinating pieces. And so communication, communicating, teaming is that additional angle, additional, uh, uh, uh you know, perspective that, that teams really needed to think about. And not, again, not just on transmitting bits over wireless signals, but in fact, what information to which teammate, when to send this information, yes. um, stuff like that. And, and it turned out to be a really interesting dynamic to the way this research progressed. Yeah. And it's interesting. It kind of catches my attention because you were saying triathlon earlier and I didn't quite mm -hmm. understand, but now it's like there are mixed events that each mode of robot may be best at. And so mm -hmm. it's like um, if one robot, say a flying robot is really good at going um, up elevator shafts, which might mm -hmm. be a very important thing in this competition then that robot is specialized for that, but it's not going to be good for exploring in general because it might kick up a bunch of dust and that could be prohibitive to its sensors. So then it can't do its job. Well, um, this kind of thing, it's a triathlon because it has many events at which of which different modes of robot may do better. It's yeah. Interesting. Yep. And yeah, exactly right. And, and even calling it a triathlon kind of glosses over the fact that uh, it, our you know, urban environments when you think urban uh, or your listeners are thinking about urban, they might have many different mental pictures of what urban underground might actually be. Some mm -hmm. might be thinking about the sewer system or others might be thinking about the metro rail or mm -hmm. others are thinking about where they park their car in the, you know, in the, in the basement lot. Um, and so that, that even within a single so-called event, right? Uh, like, like running, mm -hmm. it's like running in a very different, you know, varied course and trying to figure out yeah. how best suited. Them. You're running so in almost mud, a, you're running yeah. in, um, yeah. I don't know, upstairs, you're running, like there's a yep. ton of That's different right. environments. Exactly. It's exactly. like a tough mutter in a sense. Tough mutter. Right. Uh, that sounds thing. like a future DARPA program right there. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. How did you, um, how do you disseminate the results 
of this? Because I imagine a lot of teams came up with clever solutions. There was probably some push um, in terms of algorithms or ways of doing things. How, how do these results get pushed and folded back into the public? Yeah. So that's one of the things I'm probably most proud of from a kind of a community sense is that the sub T challenge competitors, you know, they are competitors. They're all vying for that top prize, but in the end, they were all rec you know, recognizing that this is a, an opportunity as a community to leap ahead and change the, you know, potential trajectory of, of, uh, of this research in, in robotics. And so many of these teams have, uh, gone to great lengths to open source their code, to uh, share data uh, mm -hmm. extensively. In fact, one of the limitations of trying to, you know, with with our off-the-shelf image classifiers, so object recognition, mm -hmm. you can get off-the-shelf classifiers, but what do you need? You need a lot of training data. Mm -hmm. Well, it turns out finding training data in underground environments and various There's lighting not a big and data set out there for that. Huh? Yeah, that's just like you know, <laughs> I, I, I left it. Yeah, and and so um, you know, finding that and aggregating that and uh, even even uh, collecting such data is also very intensive in time and, and labor. And so we found teams actually sharing their data sets wow. that they collected, so they had this kind of pool of data that they could train and improve collectively. And I think that was um, kind of just one small example of how communal and collaborative uh, that this community ended up being. And so all of that to say, even amidst helping each other, you know, whether it's lending monitors and screwdrivers all the way to sharing <laughs> open source code and data, um, I, I'd say all of the members of, of the subject community has really uh, embraced this idea of, of sharing it and and helping this community grow so uh, you can go to their listing of repositories they've shared not only in their publications but also uh, in their online videos mm -hmm. uh, they've shared their research they've shared their code shared their data um, many of the researchers have gone on to work on follow-on projects that are leveraging the technologies that they developed in sub -tease. in some case working with former competitors now Oh, cool. actual collaborators on these projects and so um a lot of that has kind of kind of made it out to the wild and those are just the research products uh, projects um there's also a pretty big effort amongst these teams to kind of take these hardened technologies those that have been tested in the crucible of the darpa sub t challenge and turn them into commercial products mm -hmm. and so we've seen startup companies spin out from these competitor teams productization of even some of these component technologies, you can in fact so go cool. and buy these sensor integrated sensor packages that you can slap on the hood of your car or carry in your backpack and get phenomenal uh, kind of imaging map mapping cap capabilities. Uh, that's now as a, a product. And a lot of that uh, really came out from the sub T challenge. And so again, being able to make that impact, not just the research community with code, but in fact, really turning us around and impacting the you know safety community and the security community and the um, mining industry and the construction site industry and you know all those kind of folks that can really benefit from these even the component technologies um, have already started to see that impact from from getting the research but also the technology out uh, mm -hmm. into the wild. It's been awesome for sure. Yeah, that is super cool. Uh, how, how did the, so uh, another part of this that we haven't really talked about is mm -hmm. the simulation or the virtual competition. Would you tell me a bit about this and how it relates? Yeah. So we designed the virtual competition of the sub challenge to be uh, an opportunity for us to kind of explore some of these what if cases. And that's one of the incredible values of using virtual environments to study advanced technologies. And so, whereas in the systems competition, we might take over a coal mine or an unfinished nuclear power plant, uh, you, you're only gonna get one such course, you know, one such environment. And despite having a lot of variability within that one course, there might be a whole lot of other things we might wanna study. And the virtual environment gave us those opportunities to do that. So to give you an example, 
you know, if you wanted to, you could use in the virtual competition, we uh, uh, enabled this ability to create your own world. Hmm. You could procedurally generate your tunnel-like environments or procedurally generate your own cave-like environments, specify some parameters. It would give you long and narrow or, mm -hmm. you know, highly vertical or, you know, uh, oh, it's kind cool of that it was parameterized. That. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that gives teams on competing in the virtual competition, this opportunity to test against a wide range of worlds, far greater than one would find at a single test site to kind of avoid overfitting to the problem to mm -hmm. you know, avoid studying to that one specific test. And so this virtual competition really kind of embraced that we, instead of, um, uh, testing against one virtual world. In many cases, we're testing against half a dozen, upwards of eight worlds in some cases to, to see how well a given fixed solution would work uh, against uh, a varying set of environments. Cool. And so the way this worked, uh, we invested heavily in a uh, next-gen simulation capability, Ignition Gazebo, our sub T simulator mm -hmm. and Which that simulation is environment made by um, open robotics where I'm working. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. So open robotics um, provided that virtual environment capability and, and uh, advanced the state of robotic simulation, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And in that simulator, we're able to run that in the cloud using our cloud-based simulation infrastructure that we also developed. And so now teams are able to develop, containerized solutions. So bundle their robotic software, if you will, and upload it to the cloud and run their software against our simulation environments, not knowing what the simulated worlds would look like, because of course we uh, are managing all that in the, in the cloud. Yeah. So, and you, so have the, your, you have your tests basically, which this is yeah. how well does it do in the cloud yeah. environment? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so the other fun part of this is we constructed what we call the sub T tech repo. Think of this as like your, you know, your storefront, your web-based storefront. You can go and add robots to cart. Mm -hmm. um, and what I'm doing here is I'll give each competitor 1,000 sub-T credits. Yep. And you go to this storefront, this tech repo, and each of these robots that we have virtual models of cost you some number of sub-T credits. Yeah. Up to that kind of salary cap to use a you know, fantasy league analogy here, um, <laughs> you, know, you get to build, mix and match the types of robots that you want to add to your team subject to this budget of 1,000 sub-T credits. Mm -hmm. And these different robots are all different sorts. They have different sensor payloads. They might have, again, wheeled or flying or kind of all the different, different modalities you might explore. And so it boils down now to these teams thinking about where they want to spend their sub-T credits and the number of robots they want to add to their team, and then designing their autonomy and perception solutions to best match the virtual robot teams uh, that they're constructing. Mm -hmm. And so in this way, uh, you really get to kind of explore um, you know, what are the best composition of teams uh, if, if given this cost constraint, you asked earlier if there are you know budget limitations for the yeah because I heard about factors. the virtual the, the budget yeah. and the virtual one the yeah virtual composition, so, and you I know, was I was wondering if there was something similar in the hardware and how that would work because yeah. it's quite complex if they're building hardware was my thing right right and so but, and, and so we wanted to abstract away some of the you know constraints of having to embody some of the software based side of things mm -hmm. and free up that develop, you know, the development to explore some of these other scenarios. The yes. other really big difference between the systems and the virtual competition was that in the systems competition, these robots have to report out where these artifacts are located and they can, they can uh, coordinate with a human supervisor, a single human to act as a teammate amongst the fleet of robots and that human supervisor is typically the one that's forwarding the artifact reports to, to DARPA to get scored. Mm. And so you now have this partnership. You can have the human supervisor kind of interact with the teams of robots and have the robots go take a closer look at things or maybe show a, an image or review. And high-level commands like go over yeah. there probably or whatever. That's right. Yep. And, okay. they, and, and they did. Triggered and that was a really great partnership. But in the virtual competition, 
these robots are fully autonomous. Mm -hmm. You have uploaded your software to the cloud. It's one set of software uh, that has to get run against all of these different types of virtual environments. Mm -hmm. And there's no human back and forth. And so really being able to explore complete autonomy of the solution where you don't get the chance to you know, back your robot out manually, even <laughs> if you had comes to it. Um, you know, that gave us, again, studying what this what if scenario in the future where you didn't have the luxury of having a human supervisor where mm -hmm. the levels of autonomy got to the point where you could deploy these robots to good effect in these really diverse environments. Um, so now we have, you know, uh, brackets. You have the system competition highlighting where we are. Mm -hmm. We push the state of the art in applied, realized technologies, and we also have the the solution space of what can be done in the completely autonomous regime where it's software only. And now we can quantifiably say how far are we from uh, complete autonomy, uh, autonomous solutions, or can, mm -hmm. we can quantify to some degree the value of the human teammate. Um, mm -hmm. And so the virtual competition gave us this benchmarking ability, right? Now we have comparative analysis between systems and virtual. And we did this all throughout the whole competition where we had tunnel circuit in both systems and virtual, urban in both systems and virtual. In CAVE, we couldn't do the sy systems competition, but man, did the virtual competition really shine <laughs> through in the in the face of you know the global lockdown mm -hmm. where now we had teams flocking to the virtual competition because they still were thirsty to, to develop their technologies. And so we had numerous systems competitors cross over into the virtual competition, in fact, oh. and, and carry that through uh, to really good effect. Um, so it was a lot of fun on the virtual side to kind of help us um, imagine what future technologies could be while also being closely coupled to where uh, the current state of the art of the technology was as well. Yeah. I find, the, to me, the most exciting part about that, as you said, with the benchmarking, um, it's that, so, like, I'm thinking about, like, the advancement of uh, technology and, say, like, the computer image or computer vision space. Like, we establish ImageNet, and it's a benchmark, in a sense, so that people can more fairly compare what their, how, how their algorithm performs. And yep. so what you see is people keep trying it, and then the performance keeps going up. And robotics, especially on like a behavioral level, has not really anything similar to my knowledge, except for what you're describing here, which is really cool where you can have some sort of, so you have your challenge and you have a way that people can try by basically upload their algorithm to it and it runs it given their robots and all of this to see the performance and you can see the performance over time. That's really, really interesting and very exciting to me. Yeah, I, I'm totally with you. I think this idea of being able to set those benchmarks allows for us as a community to see how well we're doing, right? And mm -hmm. see that progress. And it's exciting to see that progress and to be able to do that in near real time with this mm -hmm. side by side systems and virtual competition, I think, um, it was, you know, it was really, really cool. Uh, and I'll highlight two more things. One is, we took systems robots, so robots from the systems competition, mm -hmm. and DARPA went ahead and scanned them, generated 3D models of them, took controller code uh, that mm -hmm. were contributed um, by the competitor teams, mm -hmm. and uh, validated it against their sensor spec sheets and battery durations on, you know, quite laboriously. But mm -hmm. now, in that sub-T tech repo, this, this, uh, these virtual robot models that are digital twins of their systems, real world robots mm -hmm. now live in the tech repo. And now virtual competitors, they might not have had the resources to, to build their own robots, but they can actually go and use a All systems competitors systems. robot models in their virtual fleet. Yeah, and that's very cool if anyone had an especially good idea for like how to, yeah. uh, like a, a morphology that's really, really mm -hmm. good. And now that's we right. can play with that more as a community. Right. Awesome. Yeah, exactly right. So I'm going to pull the fantasy league analogy <laughs> uh, again. You know, if, if the virtual competition gave you the flexibility to mix and match across the league, mm -hmm. the systems competition was kind of like the, you know, like the, the NFL, right? You, you kind of have to pick your 
roster at the beginning of the season. You kind of play the players that are on your roster um, because it really is too difficult to go back and do a clean sheet design after each one of these competition events um, Mm -hmm. to to start from scratch. So you're, you're kind of trying to do that systems thinking for the systems teams holistically, but man, in virtual, you get to mix and match, Mm -hmm. um, play around, see uh, if, if you want to be an all ground team or an all air team or, you know, beg and borrow from different uh, different styles of robots. You you can do that. And and many of the competitors were able to do that exploration. And there's still, of course, significant exploration left to do. And then I'll also highlight that there's a virtual test bed, the sub T virtual test bed, Mm -hmm which encompasses the simulator and the tech repo, all of that is publicly available and open source. That's and so okay. yep, you can still go, uh, despite the competition being over, we know that the value to the community uh, is so important that DARPA uh, is keeping up the, uh, the test bed open for a period to come. Uh, you can still go to subtchallenge.world and learn how to, how to develop a sub T solution and awesome. upload it to the cloud and um, run it, you know, and, and uh, get, get free, uh, free reps <laughs> in for, yeah. uh, for your simulate, you know, your simulation solutions. And so I think, um, you yeah, the availability is another testament to, you know, how we really cherish the, the community really are interested in uh, fostering the growth of the community because that's at the end of the day, what's going to turn around and, develop those technologies that are, you know, first responders and, and war fighters and others are going to be able to make use of or precisely mm-hmm. the technologies that these people, that the, that the community develops and, and matures. Yes, for sure. Do you, do you imagine that the, the framework that you guys have developed, which hosts this, uh, the high level testing and benchmarking of this mm-hmm. challenge, do you imagine that this can be applied to other different um, like basically the whole infrastructure that you've built, do you think it can be applied to other robotics challenges, say robots like moving around an hospital and being efficient or any, any ro- any tasks that robots might be very good for to pro- and, and have this provide like a standard benchmark. So you can look at it over time and compare more fairly the algorithms and approaches. Yeah. Uh, hands down. Uh, I'm a, I'm a believer in this type of a model of being able to not only test at scale, but also mm-hmm. uh, open up the innovation space uh, by lowering the barriers to entry. And simulation is a great way you know, to avoid having to lay out capital expenses to, to build a fleet of robot and, oh, by the way, have access to a hospital or the mm-hmm. underground mines or the moon or wherever yeah. your <laughs> setting might be. Um, so absolutely think this backend infrastructure, absolutely critical uh, as a as a method, as a set of tools to, um, to, to help out. And in fact, I'm pleased to say that, uh, in fact, we are seeing this precise infrastructure being used in other robotics development oh, that's and wonderful. competition settings already. Um, huh. So the impact is already uh, near and dear. Um, and uh, uh, stay tuned to see some of those competition events making that's use so of these kind of, this kind of infrastructure. And is that infrastructure, is that in the sub-T tech repo that you've been mentioning? Or is it yeah, somewhere so, else? Yep. Yeah, ah. so the tech repo, uh, in, in the, the, the source code, if you will, of all uh, the majority of everything we talked about is... Uh, are already available. You can go to GitHub, I believe, under OSRF, um, mm-hmm. and see the sub T project there. Um, you know, nearly everything that we've talked about is already located there. So there are a handful of resources under GitHub.com slash sub T challenge, and you'll be able to find a number of resources there as well. Oh, um, yeah. Awesome. I didn't know because I haven't. It, the the sub T has never been one of my projects, so I'm not mm-hmm. that aware of what uh, where everything lives and this kind of thing. It's awesome to hear that it already is all online and people can access it and that people are also using this infrastructure to benchmark other tests and simulation. I think that's yeah. really, really exciting. Yeah, I, it, it's going to be great. And kind of the impact to not just the subterranean robotics community, which admittedly is just one sliver uh, mm-hmm. the, the community, um, but being able to open this up, you suggested kind of uh, hospital environments or mm-hmm. uh, maritime settings or other types of 
um, environments where we really want to uh, explore more broadly. I, I do think that um, you know this investment will uh, pay significant dividends for many, many years to come for the robotics community. I think you're right. Um, let's see. So we are running out of time, and by that I mean like 20 more minutes or so. And I have a, a lot of things that I want to talk about in this let's time. Do it. But you you mentioned um, the final event, and that we you'd like to talk about that and kind of how you fabricated this big environment. Uh, would you tell me a little bit more? Yeah. So, um, you know, I think one of the visions for the sub challenge from the get go was to, uh, have teams of robots that un, um, you know, unhindered by the fact that, uh, you might face all three of these environments. Now the challenge, and I've crossed, crisscross the country to try to find a place that has, tunnels, urban, <laughs> and caves all next to one another, all co-located, all connected mm -hmm. uh, in a meaningful way. If any of your listeners have if a place know. in mind, <laughs> please, please let us know. Um, so instead, as DARPA tends to do is, you know, because we are always seeking those breakthroughs, um, we transformed a limestone cavern and built a uh, one-of-a-kind course kind of think almost like Hollywood set design with the level of realism <laughs> that, um, you know, is, is, uh, you know, is very compelling for both human and robot, uh, to the degree where, um, we're getting inspiration from caves and mines and sites that we've seen. We replicated a New York city Metro station, mm -hmm. uh, all the way to steam tunnels and, um, uh, old rustic abandoned mines to uh, large caverns that are uh, either show caverns that you might go to as a tourist to the, you know, the raw caverns or the untouched ones that have a very different feel as well. Um, and so we were able to take uh, all of those different sites that we had been to or uh, found to be really compelling and fabricated. We built that. We had warehouse structures connected to a metro station, connected to a featureless hallway. And that's just a fraction of the urban setting. Mm -hmm. We had uh, small places where you had to crawl on your hands and knees up and over um, you know, different segments and places where I'm certain many dozens of times, if I hadn't had a helmet on, uh, okay. I'd be walking yeah. away with a lot of bumps and bruises. And so, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, just trying to build a place where we can test and push the boundaries of autonomy, mobility, networking, and perception was a phenomenal experience to, uh, to do that. And in having to build that course, uh, going back to where it all started with all of our, uh, stakeholders, all the end users, the people who this was going to, uh, who, who we would have to have them believe that these environments were realistic mm. enough. Right. Um, so we did go back and say, hey, what are the pieces that you need to see to to, to be able to say that you believe this technology uh, is relevant to you? And we were able to, to do that to good effect. And whether and since we were building it ourselves, we, in fact, had different segments of the course take on different personalities. And so in total, even though we had three subdomains, the tunnel, urban and cave, we in fact had like 60 different segments kind of like going on a, on almost a Disney ride through um, wow. different parts of the subterranean world uh, is what we were able to pose to these robots now facing all of that difficulty um, really, really, really allowed for uh, testing the diversity. Um, mm -hmm. And we went to great lengths, I'd say to, uh, hone that realism. We talked earlier about communications and networking, but I'll tell you, we went through various types of RF shielding and pains and other things <laughs> baked into the walls yeah. of, uh, of, of, uh, of this course, um, to be able to replicate kind of the RF, uh, propagation in underground environments. And so, um, I'm, I'm pleased to say that I think we did a, a, a good job of trying to replicate not just the uh, look and feel, but the RF, the, the, the radio frequency, the wireless transmission, mm -hmm. all the way to, um, you know, the little things like uh, um, amount of water, uh, moisture, slick surfaces, 
mm-hmm. um, rubble, gravel, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, really, really proud of uh, this one of a kind opportunity to, um, you know, raise the bar for the robotics community writ large. For sure. Yeah. It sounds like such a great test environment. That's so funny that you uh, like did shielding and things so you could get the RF properties you wanted in the environment. Mm-hmm. Amazing. Yep. Um, so I assume that will be used in future competitions or how will I, so actually, how did it go in the finals? You used this environment, correct? Yeah, that's right. How did it go? How was it? Yeah, I think, I think it was really great. Um, I, I think, uh, you know, one of the benchmarks for me as the DARPA program manager here is, um, was it hard enough, right? Uh, does it push the boundaries? It needs to be hard so that not everyone gets a hundred, um, but we don't want it to be impossibly hard because then we're not going to know where the boundaries are, where the envelope is. And so, uh, being able to design this course in a way that had the level of difficulty variance mm-hmm. that allowed some pieces of technology to really be showcased and others, um, you know, you found where their limitations were, mm-hmm. um, you know, that was really great about the, the, the environment. Um, I'll say also from the kind of the government's perspective, the DARPA team, we uh, are in the command post. Just, you know, this is not something that our competitors get a really a good glimpse of because we're all behind the scenes. Um, but in our command post, we had instrumented this course oh. with everything from cameras, of course, so we could see where robots might be. But we had things like motion detectors. We had triggers, all of our artifacts were instrumented so we could make sure that they're consistently like the Halloween house. Yeah. It, it, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so we, uh, could orchestrate, um, kind of like movie style, movie set mm-hmm. style. Like, uh, and so we had dynamic obstacles. Wow. Um, and so these would be triggered when robots entered uh, a particular area and then section, uh, of the course would collapse behind them now blocking their way home. They would wow. need to find a new, way they would not be able to follow their that's amazing home and so that was built into the course as well actuated from um you know from these types of uh signals that uh we had instrumented this course with and so it does seem like a hollywood setup yeah it it, it, in, in many ways it was and it was always done with a technology objective in mind and Mm -hmm. that's the cool part about it is Mm -hmm. that showing this collapse was something that was very relevant to many of our, for example, mine rescue personnel, because that's one of the hard things is Mm -hmm. uh, uh, debris collapses or debris integrity checks of of the environment. And so collapsing uh, part of this was near and dear to them. But for us, we were (laughs) interested in testing the autonomy, the ability to Mm -hmm. recognize that your map has changed and then your way home is no longer viable. You got to find another way home. Um, And so there was a really fun way, a really tight way of coupling the operational kind of need and insight with the technology that we were trying to push. And this one of a kind course was explicitly designed, you know, from, from uh, CAD drawing all the way to uh, graphic artist painting uh, inside the course um, to be able to deliver that type of, tight coupling between operational and technical objectives. Mm -hmm. Gosh, that sounds amazing. Do you have, is there like a YouTube of like a walkthrough of this course? I haven't seen it. Yeah, there are. So uh, you can go to DARPA TV. That's the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of our videos have been uh, placed there. There Mm -hmm. are walkthroughs of every course that we DARPA has uh, transformed into a competition course. So you can go and do a walkthrough of a hard rock, like a gold mine, a coal mine, a nuclear power plant. And then of course our grand finale, uh, final event course, there are uh, multiple walkthrough videos. And then this might be a good opportunity to share that DARPA also collected very high resolution, um, high accuracy data sets mm-hmm. of these environments to the point where we could, uh, down to, of course, cause we're also scoring the artifact mm-hmm. position reports. So yeah. we were down at the you know millimeter scale of uh, accuracy, and we've released that as a public data set as well. So if you weren't able to test in the final event course, well, you can actually go to the Sub T Tech repo mm-hmm. on the virtual side and get a mesh, a three D 
rendering a 3D version of the final event world mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and see what it looks like for your robots as well. And fun fact here, one of the final event virtual competition worlds was in fact a 3D virtual world of the systems competition final event world. Ah, so cool. kind of bringing everything full circle, now you get this chance to test how the systems competitors were testing in this, mm -hmm. again, un unique, one-of-a-kind world. And at the same time, we're running virtual competitors through the same exact course, uh, having developed this 3D model um, of, of the course with all the, uh, all the pain, same pain points as the real robots had to face, um, yes. but not in the virtual domain. And so all of that's been publicly released. Um, you can see the video, but if you want the point cloud, you can download the point cloud yourself and mm -hmm. work with it, uh, or the mesh, uh, the 3d virtual mesh file is available. So you can, you know, do, uh, put it in your own simulators if you wish, or load it up in the sub T simulator and, and drive some robots around. So cool. What a great public offering. That's so, it's so neat that people have access to all of this. Mm -hmm. Let's see. So I, I have a few things that I want to talk about, and we have like really 10 minutes left or so. Would it be all right if we run a little long or is it? Um, yeah, I, absolutely. I, oh, okay. Um, so one thing that's very interesting to me, and I really, really wanted to talk about this. So I'm very happy um, you, we can run a little long. But can you tell me, like one of the huge challenges, I believe, in setting this whole thing up, which we talked about a bit before, is figuring out how to scope these challenges. Cause you want to make it so it's not like, like as you were just saying, um, you don't want all the teams to fail cause it's too hard. And then it drives no innovation because no one can do anything. Um, but you don't want to make it too easy. Also, how, can you just talk a bit about scoping the entire sub T challenge? Yeah. Yeah. I and think the process of that. Yeah. You know, I think it boils back down to, um, really doing our homework and kind of getting, I, I think that's what uh, DARPA is all about is not only gauging where the current state of technology is and not only kind of trying to understand the trend lines of where technology might be gradually going, but understanding the levers where if we were to exercise some, you know, uh, nudge here, poke there, test that, that we would actually bend the curve of the trajectory and accelerate where technology is going to go. I think that's what DARPA's you know, foundational mission is to, mm -hmm. to try to create that kind of technological surprise. And so by doing our homework, both on terms of where the technology is, but also what the end users really needed, kind of doing that, that um, you know, where we want to be, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and we want to skate to that, to where the puck's going to be, um, combined with knowing uh, where we were, um, you know, I think it really was um, uh, a laborious process to, to tune and tweak the oh, yeah. evolution of the challenge to be able to arrive as well as we have to, to this end result of having advanced as much as we had. And so I'll tell uh, a story here. At one of our very early events, um, we transformed a, a, a gold mine um, into a test course. And this was not for competition. It was really just a test. It was an integration test, really. Um, so we invited competitors, if they wanted to, to come out and test. Uh, and we had done it up much like a competition course. And this was really to give teams a first look at what DARPA had in store for them. Mm -hmm. And so when we conducted this, um, teams went in and uh, you can safely say they got their butts kicked, right? Um, <laughs> I think they uh, realized that, you know, it's the little things that will get you in addition to the big things that they were worried about. And mm -hmm. one of the things that it became a tradition afterwards, but we took all of our competitors on a walking tour of the entirety of the course that we had laid out, that DARPA had laid out. Mm -hmm. And whereas most teams maybe made it I'll, I'll be generous and say the best team made it 10% into this first oh. test course. Yeah. When we went on the walking tour and showed them how far and how expansive this course really was, you could very easily imagine that there are those out there who would say, man, this is impossible. What is DARPA thinking? They'll never, mm -hmm. you know, no one can ever accomplish this. And yes, they did say that to some degree. Like, this is impossible, man. Um, Tim, what are you <laughs> Yeah. Um, 
But no, what really uh, kind of stuck with me is that the prevailing sentiment after that walkabout tour in that very first course was not that this can't be done, but that we didn't do it. But man, somebody believes in us that, you know, DARPA must believe that this is possible because otherwise, why would they have crawled up that one ladder <laughs> in the far reaches of this mine? Why would they have kind of probably twisted ankles to climb up to that location <laughs> to place that cell phone? <laughs> How come they hauled a, you know, 80 pound mannequin uh, three kilometers into this course if they didn't think that this was possible? And that spark, I think, for them of setting the bar really high, um, you know, and, and saying, yes. We think that in due time, uh, you, you accelerate the technology to get to this point, you will be able to conquer a good portion of this course in the future. And, and that trajectory, I think, has continued to uh, manifest throughout the challenge. And so by the time they got to their final event, you have many teams on record saying that, you know, you ask, if you ask them three years ago or four years ago, if they could have conquered or can't handle any part of this final event course, they'd say absolutely not. But mm -hmm. the fact that we're here, and truth be told, by the way, I, you know, I don't think we talked about it, uh, DARPA placed a fixed number of artifacts in these courses. And so for the final event, we placed 40 artifacts in mm -hmm. nearly half a mile of underground terrain that we had built. And the, the highest scoring teams scored 23 points, 23 mm -hmm. artifacts. So you might say, Tim, hey, that's kind of a failing grade, right? That's kind of like well, 50 yeah. percent, uh, yeah. just over 50 percent. And you're saying you did a great job. Well, yeah, that's a phenomenal job, given mm -hmm. the difficulty level that we know is where we want to be. Right. And so, mm -hmm. again, um, it's really been um, showcasing that the technology still has a lot of headroom to grow. Mm -hmm. um, but to be able to quantify the level of impact, right? We're able to cover this massive environment in a, about an hour with robots that frankly took an order of magnitude, even two orders of magnitude longer with my human team to go gather that high precision data. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it took them uh, a fair bit longer to be able to yeah. go and, and do what robots are doing in under an hour under duress, never mm -hmm. having seen the course before. Um, that's a market improvement that we can point to and say four years sure. ago, we might not have been able to do it if not for this high bar that DARPA sets. And, and I think that calibration process is a iterative thing that we've, um, you know, fine tuned, I think, uh, here at DARPA. Uh -huh. I think it would be more worrying if people got all 40 already, that would mean the challenge was not hard enough to yeah. me because it's a benchmark. I mean, if you look at, again, going back to like ImageNet, um, it'd be mm -hmm. like 50% level when they were starting and then it's like creeping up 70 percent now maybe or 80 or whatever it is but it starts pretty low and then you have plenty of room to improve because you have a hard challenge in getting all of it especially in that like limited period of time that yeah, you have right. right like that's a real challenge yeah that's very interesting yeah wholly and, agree and think that there's um you know really promising work to get to be done and, and to be accomplished mm -hmm, for sure and you were mentioning DARPA has this very iterative process um, for scoping, like difficulty yeah. of these things. Can you talk a bit about that? Because that's really interesting to me. Sure. And so specifically for the sub D challenge, we had designed it so that we would have those opportunities to, to, to learn as we go. Um, so mm -hmm. by virtue of how we constructed the sub D challenge, we held that first event where teams first saw what DARPA had in store. But then uh, about six months after, there was the tunnel circuit where we conducted our first event focusing on tunnel environments, in this case, a coal mine. Mm -hmm. And and then we broke that up into, again, six months after an urban setting. And so the, the teams knew that if they were going to be competitive at the final event where they were anticipating that all three of these environments would all get mashed together, then they should be thinking about their designs from the get-go that can survive, quite frankly, uh, <laughs> tunnel, urban cave, all the way to the very end. And so we saw teams to kind of internalize this, this need for resilience in their early kind of design scoping. And so uh, they went to the tunnel and man, were there a lot of really hard lessons learned at the mm -hmm. tunnel event. But what you saw was a, a learning, not just 
by team, but across teams. An example is that, hey, uh, using a, uh, a sensor on the outside to be able to help correct as robots still within line of sight of the, the mouth of the, of the tunnel, you know, we had uh, a team that was using that. And so they could extend how far their accuracy was, you know, subject to drift. They, they, could, they could extend how far they were by using this total station sensor to, to correct for any drift. And yeah, that's, that's clever. And so even, even at the tunnel circuit, you saw teams going out and trying to find, and they found a local university and borrowed one of these total stations and tried to use it. And by the urban circuit, you had more teams using such a technology. Same goes for legged robots. Say legged robots didn't do so well at the tunnel circuit, but at the urban circuit where there were stairs and curbs and other things, man, those legged robots really shine. And so at the final event, you saw a lot of legged robots coming to the fore. And so that's what I mean by the iteration. There was multiple opportunities for these teams to come field, go through the, uh, the, the rigor of a competition event, but that mm-hmm. wasn't the end of it. They would have to go home, lick their wounds, and <laughs> then yeah. kind of come back and do it again. And then, of course, break some more robots and learn what it means to have to operate in the cold, uh, cold in nuclear power plant or the humid limestone cavern or, you know, all of those kind of things. We baked in that iteration and the, um, kind of the opportunity to learn quickly and often into mm-hmm. the sub challenge. And I think as a roboticist myself, I think that's where you learn the most is by thinking and then doing, right? Uh, thinking, Definitely. doing, breaking, learning, and then thinking and doing it again. Okay. Um, and field robotics, I think, is, uh, you know, needs that. And sometimes trying to do robotics in the field, especially at the scales that the sub T challenge was interested in really hard logistically. Um, you know, it takes a lot of time, a lot of people power to, to, to transport robots and, and get things set up. But, um, you know, sub T challenge really gave all these teams, not only the excuse, but the, the incentive to have to go and, and test in the wild. And many of the teams, especially the top performing teams, uh, really took that to heart, found, you know, I'm partnered with local caver clubs, uh, local so cool. caving clubs to go and gain access to their caves and practice, uh, or you know, you know, all of those kind of opportunities. I think came about um, mm-hmm. with many, many lessons learned. A um, lot of, lot of, a uh, lot of broken robots, um, but uh, a whole cadre of field roboticists, uh, the next generation, I'd say, of field roboticists coming out, um, having been. Uh, battle tested in the sub T challenge. Mm, that's really cool. So that makes me um, curious about kind of the long term role of DARPA in all of this. So you're, you're mentioning like one thing very interesting is you're mentioning training the next generation of field robotics, roboticists. Uh, can you just talk a bit more about the role of DARPA? Yeah. As, as you see kind of on a bigger picture. Sure. Well, you know, at its heart, DARPA is always going to be about bringing about technological surprise and those breakthrough technologies that will have broad impact uh, overall. And whether that's deep investments that will lead to uh, breakthroughs when we need them. And an example of that is the mRNA vaccine approach that in the time of COVID uh, was um, investments by DARPA early on to Mm. identify that kind of methodology in the time of need where it would arise. And so identifying, you know, uh, those opportunities where even if you uh, don't need it today, but you might need it in the future, that's what DARPA is all about. And I think, uh, recognizing that the state of the technology for robotics, field robotics, wasn't where we wanted it to be in the future. Um, that's what DARPA was, uh, eager to, uh, inspire and Mm -hmm. incentivize and, uh, then help you know, shape that future trajectory. As far as building a community, I really love the DARPA challenge model for innovation where, um, you know, we have uh, a a couple of different ways that we seek out uh, revolutionary ideas, but the challenge model is just one type of those. And 
And I really love it because it also gives us an opportunity to think about solving a problem without having to find the solution. Um, mm -hmm. and when you do that and the community hasn't yet uh, been formed around that problem area or the solution space, um, the DARPA challenge is fantastic for being able to plant the seed and nurture this community that's now going to go off and do great things, right? So the DARPA, uh, first DARPA Grand Challenge, self-driving cars through the desert or in the urban environments, you know, mm -hmm. had planted the seed for a lot of the kind of the self-driving tech uh, investments today. Um, for sure. And I imagine that many of the types of technologies that we've discovered and invested in for the Sub-T Challenge uh, will have that long-term impact um, while also, and I'm excited to say, have a very near-term impact for many of our end users as well, given how we structured um, this, this challenge to kind of think about marrying, mm -hmm. um, you know, what the, what, the, what the end user needs tomorrow, <laughs> uh, not just uh, many years from now. So I think being able to span that has been a real hallmark of the DARPA Subterranean Challenge of uh, understanding what the near problem is, as well as anticipating and planting the seed for the communities to address the far problems as well. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Let's see. So um, I, I don't know how it works, but um, what's next? Yeah. Like well, what next with the sub T challenge next with uh, maybe another, I, I suppose grand challenges take a long time to think about, and I don't know if things can be revealed, but what's next? Yeah. Well, I'll say that uh, the sub T challenge has concluded. And while we have all of those resources, all of the open source repositories, all the things that we talked about available out there, um, it's my wish that folks, you know, take it and run with it. They can uh, uh, reinvent or recreate or invent a new uh, different types of approaches to solving some of these types of problems. Um, and so I think that uh, what we see already in the community is kind of we've uh, spun up the flywheel and now it's operating on its own momentum and it's really invigorating and inspiring to see uh, all these folks already out there, um, uh, you know, organizing amongst themselves the, the ability to have this kind of an impact uh, and being a resource. Um, as far as DARPA is concerned, I think, um, you know, if any of your listeners have uh, ideas for grand challenges, that's uh, an opportunity here. I think um, DARPA is always on the lookout for those types of problems, those kind of technology questions that are out there that don't have or would benefit from not having a predefined solution, kind of a, a direction to go. You, you know that there's a breakthrough rating to happen, um, but you don't quite have a finger on where that breakthrough is going to come from. Uh, mm -hmm. And a challenge model is great. And so uh, DARPA, I, I, I am uh, certain that the DARPA challenge model is here to stay. Uh, it, it, it will, as it, like all things at DARPA, continue to evolve and, and um, uh, tailor itself to the technology of, of interest. Um, but now I'm excited to say that, uh, you know, the Ch DARPA challenge model has demonstrated, at least with sub T, that it's uh, it's an exciting way to both drive a community and drive technology development. Mm -hmm. So wrapping up, um, do you have any links, websites, anything to share? I know the sub T website, so I'll include that in the post. Anything, anything else to highlight? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, if you go to one of the repositories we mentioned earlier, the GitHub repo slash sub T challenge, there you'll see uh, a project there just called simply sub T resources. But this is where it's kind of the one-stop shop for all of the references, links to software that the competitors themselves have now released. So you can see that the data sets that both DARPA have provided, as well as many that sub T community has developed and, and curated are there. Links to papers and other materials are there. Um, so, you know, I'd, I'd encourage folks to go check that out. And then, of course, the DARPA TV YouTube channel has uh, many, many videos that you can go learn about the Sub-T Challenge, its impact and why it matters, as well as learn about all the teams as well. So I, I think those are uh, you know, a great place to start. 
And if you're interested in learning more about DARPA, I think DARPA.mil is a is a fantastic landing point for, for any of your listeners. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Cool. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to my conversation with Tim Chung. Thank you again to our founding sponsor, Open Robotics. See you next time.